Hello, and welcome to the first presentation of the second day of the 2020 FOP Virtual Family Gathering. I'm excited to welcome our four panelists of doctors to the Common Health Questions for FOP Medical Experts panel featuring international treaters today. Before we dive into the panel, I just wanted to share a few helpful housekeeping pieces of information with our attendees watching from home. If you're looking for translation services during this presentation, please click on the third tab in the chat Q&A box that is labeled Wordly. You'll be able to select the language for your translation for today's presentation in that box. Additionally, if you would like to resize your viewing screens for the video, the slides, or the chat at any point in the presentation, you are free to do that on your mobile browser at home. Joining us today is Dr. Richard Keene, Dr. Chris Scott, and Dr. Pa pa Dr. Patricia Delay, and Dr. Genevieve Bujat. This is the first time we've been able to have international treaters from across the world to join us on, a, on this special panel. And we are exceptionally grateful to all of you for taking the time out of your busy days to be a part of this presentation. Dr. Richard Keene will start us off. Dr. Keene is the head of the Center for Metabolic Bone Disease at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in London, United Kingdom. He is gonna be sharing some COVID and flu related concerns for the FOP community. Over to you, Dr. Keene. Thank you very much indeed, Hope, and say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you're sort of watching this, um, this, um, th these presentations. So I'm, I'm delighted to be with everyone sort of in this virtual environment. And as I say, hopefully in the next sort of five or 10 minutes, we will deal with um, something which a year ago, obviously, you know, this um, sort of topic was not anything with, on our minds, but obviously, in the last 12 months, uh, COVID-19 has become the big sort of health uh, issue affecting the whole world. And I thought it'd be useful to share with the community some some thoughts and some uh, obviously some very recent sort of information. For those, whoops, sorry, here we go. Um, for those people that um, may be aware, the International Clinical Council on FOP has published some guidelines and precautions and general information for patients and their families. Um, I've put the website address on this slide um, here. And we've basically been involved with updating the guidelines as of the sort of the healthcare situation has changed. Um, but these guidelines from the 17th of July are still very much to deal with most of the relevant information. And I'd urge people, you know, after um, this presentation, uh, at some point, obviously, to, to go and look at these. They give people pretty much fairly good general information. And then obviously, you would need to probably go and just check the healthcare uh, situation in each individual country, because there will be subtle differences between countries as to how uh, each healthcare system is managing um, the coronavirus uh, epidemic. What I'm going to do now is just show you a um, a, a download that I, I got from the, w, the WHO um, sort of website from yesterday. And this bubble map just gives a, a sort of a schema of the, uh, the number of cases that uh, have been reported uh, to the WHO uh, with um, COVID-19. And you can see very much, you know, it, it's a global um, sort of in involvement. Almost all countries in the world are affected. And obviously the number of individuals that have been reported sort of over sort of 50 million uh, with with over one and a half, almost one and a half million uh, deaths reported. So it's obviously a very, very big um, healthcare problem. And again, we know that lots of patients with other um, conditions um, are obviously concerned and worried about how, um, how, how the condition may affect them. I think one thing from my side, and again, I think it would be very interesting to sort of hear from the community, but as far as I'm aware, I've not been aware of any individual with FOP who's actually been affected uh, with COVID. And this probably means that, you know, as, as, as a community, you've been very good at sort of um, shielding yourself and, and, and avoiding uh, contact with individuals who, who may have been exposed. Um, so perhaps what we're going to be talking about is more sort of um, theoretical uh, and just helping people just keep keep going because we know this has been a long slog um, for a lot of us um, uh, this year and it's probably not going to be until next year that things start to start to improve. 
Uh, but again, I think it's really important that, you know, if people have been infected, that, you know, hopefully your clinicians uh, will know about this because, again, we can learn uh, from uh, how, how we treat individual patients uh, with, the, with rarer conditions and how they get through ha having a, a virus such as COVID-19. Again, over time, we've learned, you know, what are the symptoms of, of the condition? And again, it's very much like a lot of viral illnesses. But again, I think in, in this current climate, if, if you develop any of these symptoms, and this, this is what the in, in our UK healthcare system, if individuals develop a high temperature, a new or continuous cough, and then this other thing that we've realised is more important, this loss of, 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 or change of smell or taste, these uh, conditions should give people concern that they may have uh, COVID-19. And again, in the UK, the, 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 the advice if you have those symptoms is, is you must get a, a COVID antigen test. And if it's positive, you would then need to self-isolate for 10 days to prevent the spread of the disease. If you're a family member living with someone who has the disease, again, in the UK, the recommendation would be that, you know, if someone in your household tests positive, then you would have to sort of, as a, as a family, self-isolate for 14 days uh, to allow, obviously, not to spread and, 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 and leave and, and, and give the, um, spread the virus um, around. I think, again, one thing that's been We've noticed again in, in I think in in, in the western uh, part of the countries as as in as with the return of schools is a lot of children will end up getting symptoms like this. It won't be COVID, but it has a big impact on the education. And again, I think a lot of families with FOP have taken the decision perhaps to you know remove their child from from from, from some degree of schooling to reduce exposure uh, to uh, other children who may have some of these other symptoms. The other problem as well, and again, I think this is one of the issues that we need to be very careful. And again, I think this is why shielding um, is, is perhaps really important, is that these other symptoms, which are obviously less common, I mean, a lot of these will could be anything, you know, they, they could be any other illnesses that you may get. Um, obviously, even some of the symptoms, you know, aches and pains, I mean, could you, some patients with FOP, it may even be sort of the start of a flare. So I think it's just very difficult that when you get these slightly softer signs, is, is it COVID or isn't it? And I think this again explains why the disease is um, so um, uh, so sort of um, difficult to sort of contain because a lot of people who, if they've got these mild symptoms, are not really aware that they could be spreading the condition. So I think having access to testing, and again, different countries are, are moving forward with access to testing both symptomatic people, perhaps with these symptoms, but in the ideal world, you'd be trying to move to testing even asymptomatic um, individuals who don't have any symptoms at all, because a lot of us may just be carrying the virus without realising it. Again, the WHO come up with an idea of saying, well, okay, it, it, given that we, at the moment we don't have a, um, a, a definitive treatment, we need to sort of obviously try and avoid um, the exposure to the virus. One thing that they see is avoiding the three C's. Um, so that's, you want to avoid spaces that are closed, i.e. indoor. So actually being outdoors um, is, is, is safer than being indoors. You obviously want to avoid crowded places uh, and also you want to in, try and reduce close contact with individuals. So again, if you if you just remember the three C's uh, and then try and obviously work in, and live your life uh, without that, I think that would be um, that that is, is 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 really important. And again, in the UK, this is lifted from sort of the UK's government um, sort of strategy. But obviously, again, there are lots of things that we can do as a community um, to, to, to sort of reduce our, our, the risk of catching and spreading uh, COVID-19. Um, obviously, with regards to washing our hands, uh, again, this is should be standard practice for anyone that might you know, be worried about spreading a viral or any sort of bacterial type infection. Uh, but again, I think just you know making sure that you've got uh, proper um, sort of alcohol wipes and of trying to avoid touching your your eyes and your face and again uh, so, you know that even if, if that's just with individuals or with even with your family members that are helping to look after you so again I, I think I think just looking after your hand hygiene um, and and is is, is is very very important. Again, something that's developed, and again, something that perhaps in 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 the in in the Western world we were perhaps a bit slower on the uptake compared to other parts of the world was 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 wearing up was wearing face coverings. I think for you know a lot of individuals, and again, this is this is 
the recommendations from the WHO, and again, different countries will have um, slightly different views on this. Um, but again, obviously, if you're not in a high risk group, just having a general fabric uh, mask um, will probably protect you spreading the virus to some degree and also catching it. Um, and then perhaps some of these more medical and surgical masks are, are thought to perhaps be if you're in a higher risk group, uh, because they probably are slightly more effective um, at uh, at sort of preventing transmission of the virus. I think again, for medical professionals, um, obviously there are some other um, sort of, um, some of the masks may even be, be, be more um, better at protecting, but those are for us that are doing more invasive procedures with our patients. But I think again, wearing masks is now becoming uh, more of a accepted thing to, to prevent the tr uh, transmission of the, of the disease, particularly in areas where you can't uh, do uh, social, social contact. And then again, there's been debate about trying to keep your distance from individuals. And again, that, that can be easier in the outside environments, but obviously again, and the WHO proposing at least one meter distance, and this is again, different in different countries. Uh, and again, just you just need to be aware of what your individual countries uh, would actually uh, recommend for the uh, for the distance to keep away from individuals. Obviously, when people are needing carers, obviously that space is going to be reduced. But then you need to make sure they're following all the other measures with masks and hand hygiene. I think one thing important for the FOP community is the um, obviously we know that a, a lot of you at times of flare up will be treated with uh, glucocorticoids, maybe for a very short four day course, or maybe a slightly longer intensive course. Now, we know that steroids will reduce um, your immunity a little bit. And so obviously there is some concern that perhaps, you know, the steroids might increase your uh, tendency to, um, to, 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 to catch illnesses such as COVID. Um, but um, again, we, we do know that, again, a, a similar steroid, something called dexamethasone, has been shown in clinical trials to actually reduce the severity of the disease when you have it and you're severely ill in hospital. We don't know, obviously, whether taking the steroids slightly earlier in the disease course will actually have a positive impact. But I think the most important thing on this slide is if you are on steroids for a flare-up, or if, you're, if you are on them chronically, some patients we know are on chronic steroids, don't stop them abruptly. That could be very dangerous. You should discuss any concerns you have about steroids with your um, healthcare professional because it would be dangerous to, to, to stop, um, stop, stop quickly. Obviously, you know, the excitement in the last week or so has been, you know, the development or the, re the release of some early information uh, regarding vaccines. There are at least 100 candidates um, being developed uh, worldwide, and these are just some of the ones that have perhaps announced some results uh, within the last one to two weeks. And I think this is giving us a window um, and hopefully an opportunity to, um, to, to, to move into a, a, newer, a, a newer environment. Um, the slide here just demonstrates, you know, a very briefly sort of, you know, some of the differences between the, the, the main drugs, uh, the main vaccines that have come out. So you have the, um, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, which is an RNA type new vaccine. The, and this obviously has to be kept at minus 70. So there may be some issues about how readily available that's going to be in different parts of the of the country or different parts of the world. It's also the same with the Moderna vaccine, uh, but this is perhaps not it's not kept such a it's kept at such a frozen uh, uh, frozen amount. And then you've got the AstraZeneca um, vaccine with uh, with with Oxford University, and again this is kept more at a regular fridge temperature. So there may be more access to, uh, to the wider uh, to the wider population throughout the world. I think what's really important is is that you know these are the early vaccines. They do look very effective. You know, ninety percent, ninety five percent effectiveness in some of the um, the trials that have been reported to date. Um, if you think of vaccinating the whole world, we're going to need probably several vaccines and any one company is not going to be able to spread these all out across the world. So I think it's actually, um, you know, really important that, you know, that we're, that we're seeing these developments of the drugs um, that hopefully will, will come on to being used within the next um, few months. And hopefully 2021 will be better than uh, 2020 has been. I think just again, I just wanted to put this up here because I think there are some unanswered questions that we just need to be aware of, which perhaps again are you know important both for us just as as uh, you know members of the of the human population, but also for people with FOP. I think at the moment, you know, the the uh, vaccine studies have not included children. I think that the, there are some. Um, plans to go down to the age of 12 years of age in some of the as, as they move forward. Um, but at the moment, we don't have any information regarding um, patients um, who, are, who are younger. 
Again, a lot of the patients, although they've had some illnesses, again, they, they haven't had um, a condition such as FOP, so we don't know whether the vaccine is going to be safe um, for, the, for, the, for the patients. At the moment, all these vaccines are given by intramuscular injection, which we know would be a complete no. So we need to obviously be aware that these vaccines can be safe and, and effective if given by the subcutaneous route. And also, again, what we don't know is basically the, both the, the long-term safety. These trials have only been running for you know a few, a few, a, 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 for sort of up to six months, and also how long does the protection last? So I think there's you know there's something that you know we we, we, that we still need to see um, how these drugs might fit for the FOP patients. But again, for family members, if we can again make sure you're protected, then hopefully that means that the the individual with FOP uh, will also have a lower risk of catching the condition. Very briefly, again, just the other thing to be aware of is the fact that obviously, you know, COVID is not the only virus out there um, for, for us as individuals and for people with FOP. I think it's really important that, you know, you remember the, you know, the medical management guidelines. There's a section in that talking about immunizations um, and influenza is an illness again, which is prevalent in the, in, in, the, in the winter months. And I would urge people to, to get your flu shot because again, that can be given subcutaneously. Um, it will reduce your risk of catching influenza and the combination of FOP and uh, of, of FOP influenza and COVID could actually be a very bad combination. We know that people that get flu and get COVID do very badly. So I would urge people, you know, although we're waiting for the COVID vaccines, there are other vaccines for other illnesses out there. We really, really need to make sure that we um, that we get um, that, that, that you get those if, it, if it's available in your healthcare system uh, at this uh, for, uh, as, as we go into winter months. So finally, I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, as I say, I know 2020 has been a tough year for everyone. I think, you know, that I think it's great that, you know, we, we have events like this, that we can come together as a community. I think that, you know, that there are exciting developments in how we can manage COVID. Uh, and again, I think that hopefully 2021 will be far better. Um, but as I say, watch this space, keep in contact with, the, with your health professionals, and we will all get through this together. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand back to Hope now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Keene. I know COVID is a topic that's certainly um, on most people's minds, and that was a very educational and um, yet still optimistic outlook on um, the next year and some of the things we should be aware of moving forward. Thank you for sharing that. Up next, we're going to hear from Dr. Chris Scott. Dr. Scott is the head of pediatric rheumatology at Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital in the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Today, Dr. Scott will be sharing some issues specific to children living with FOP. Hello, everyone. Um, could you please advance my slides? Hello, everyone. It's um, really great to, to meet all of you, uh, even at a distance. And uh, I'm sitting in, in Cape Town with my um, entire Cape Town FOP community, and we're all, all gathered here, and it's wonderful to be able to speak to you all. Um, I'm having a little trouble advancing my slides. I'm just trying to get there. And yeah, I think, I think I'm good now. Great, so I, I'd like to talk to you about uh, FOP in childhood. Childhood is, of course, a time that we as parents want only the best for our children, uh, the happiest years of their lives. Um, and I think part of the agony of, of uh, the difficulty of having a, being a, receiving a di diagnosis of FOP uh, when you, um, for your child is, is that sense of, of concern for what's going to happen to their childhood and, and the loss that one might feel. Um, and, and the, the worry uh, about uh, about childhood uh, issues. So I'd like to take a, a, an, a, some, an, an approach to try and see how we can uh, look at what it takes to be happy in childhood. Um, and for that, I've adapted Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which says that uh, we all have needs, physiological needs, and once those are satisfied, we can move on to the next level of needs, which is uh, safety and security, and then belongingness and love needs, esteem needs, eventually self-actualization. And following this whole pyramid, the theory goes 
is what will make people happy and also what motivates people. People that can only move on to one level once they've achieved another one. Um, and so when we're looking at an FOP in childhood, I've just scribbled some notes onto Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy to try and show you some of the um, some, some thoughts. So the first is uh, the physiological need. Uh, even at this very basic level, there are many, many things that we should be considering for children with FOP. Um, so if one looks at food, um, the food should be healthy. It should be good for your teeth. Uh, it's important to, because dental health is so very important in FOP, making an early start not only on giving healthy, a healthy diet, but also give, making an early start uh, on teaching a healthy diet, which will be sustained for the rest of the child's life, is very important. Um, to, uh, to protect, uh, to, to create good eating habits and to protect teeth going on into the future. Um, it's also important to eat a low sugar diet and to be as healthy as possible in general uh, because that will reduce the risk of other diseases and other comorbidities uh, that, that might affect people who become overweight and so forth. It's also important to eat enough, and we heard yesterday um, from. Um, uh, from, from, from colleagues uh, from Mona about, um, about the risk of losing too much weight uh, when, when one has FOP. And, and, and at some stage, of course, the diet needs to become heavily really specialized if, if children are having difficulty chewing because of uh, jaw muscle involvement. Um, it's important, even at this basic physiological need, to get enough water. We've heard yesterday as well from, from Professor Pignola about. Uh, kidney stones and the risk of kidney stones and, and creating a good habit of drinking enough water early on in a child's life is important and to not substitute uh, fluid intake with, uh, with sugary drinks, for instance. It's also very important in childhood to appreciate that children want to play and then easily overextend themselves. Um, but it, uh, and, and, and overstraining muscles and so on can be uh, a risk in FOP. But it's only really when one takes on dedicated, hard physical exercise that children are pushed beyond their comfort uh, where, it, um, where, where, where muscle strain might become an issue. So when young people are very uh, active in sport, it's in, important just to, to moderate some of the more extreme activities. So it's also important to, to, uh, to, to rest enough and to get enough sleep. And lastly, uh, on this level, we've heard about um, how important it is to live in a safe environment. Uh, this conference is full of advice on how to adapt houses, how to um, make environments safer for children, how school can be made safer, and so on. So moving up to the next level of uh, its safety and security, well, here there are probably the most things we can do to protect children with FOP and to give them the safest environment possible. Again, we come to the home environment and school environment, uh, such as that picture of the stairs I have up there. Uh, I have one patient here lives in an upstairs apartment with very slippery stairs, and this is this has caused a number of falls, and clearly something needed to be done about the home environment, and that needed some support. Um, it's important as well to be safe in terms of immunization. There has been so much talk about the COVID immunization, but of course, there are many other immunizations that children should get and that children um, uh, require in order to be happy. But of course, the most important thing is that not every child with FFP can get every vaccine, and some uh, vaccines are contraindicated, uh, whereas that, although the most can be, can be given, but it's essential, essential, essential to remember that they should not be given into the muscle, um, as this can cause muscle injury, but that they should be given subcutaneously. Even immunizations that, uh, that the doctors are used to giving intramuscularly should be given subcutaneously. And we heard Professor Kaplan talking about that a lot yesterday. Then there are uh, other needs that we need to look after in terms of safety and security. It's important for the child's safety to know about dental health and to know about uh, the risks of, of inappropriate uh, uh, interventions in the mouth, such as uh, having a dentist who knows about FOP uh, is, an uh, is an important uh, component of the healthcare. A dentist who doesn't know about FOP might easily um, uh, do in, uh, injections into the mouth or might overstretch the jaw, uh, etc. So it's important when you're going to a dentist to make sure that your dentist 
is informed about FOP. And if you go to one and you live in a country where there isn't such a dentist, please make contact with your nearest, uh, with the IFOPA or with one of your, your nearest local um, FOP specialist center and get their dentist to talk to your dentist before you allow them to do anything in, in your child's mouth. Um, uh, anesthetic risk is another important thing that you can, where we actually can provide a safe environment for children. And it's again, exactly the same advice as for dentistry. You need to um, get in touch with um, a, a unit that knows how the anesthetic should be handled in children with FOP um, and not subject your child uh, to unnecessary risks um, by, by, by uh, using anesthetists that are not experienced in FOP or that have not been, had an opportunity to be schooled in FOP. School is a huge part of every child's life. It's probably the biggest part of my childhood that I can remember. And again, school is a, can be a very, very difficult place for children, but can also be an absolutely happy place and a place where they, they, they make, make their best friends and make their best memories. And it's important to know that all children with FOP should, be, should go to school. Um, but because there are so many issues uh, that need to be addressed, it's important to, to take a look at the IFOPA website and look at the advice they've got. I could do another 40 minutes just on school advice, and, uh, but, but I think the IFOP has done a fantastic job on their webpage in addressing some of the issues. Um, and, and sometimes it's important to be proactive about, about these and, and, and not wait for problems at school to come up but to address them before your child goes to school. And the last thing I want to say about safety is um, hearing. Hearing is an important part of life. We all uh, love and enjoy music. And of course, it's important for our survival. And hearing, unfortunately, is one of the areas of, of a child with FOP's life that could become affected. Um, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and deafness is not uncommon in people with FOP. So it's important to protect your child's ear health uh, uh, by limiting or controlling uh, uh, the exposure that they have to uh, to noise, especially nowadays in the days of of uh, cellular telephones and um, and uh, and uh, earphones and head headphones, um, our children's ears take a real battering. I have a very difficult time getting earphones out of my children's ears. I must say, and so that is something that that just needs to be take the, that you need to be cognizant of. Um, now, the esteem needs, I'm now branching a little bit out of medicine here, but, I, but I, I've learned so much from the FAP community and from specific people in this community about how they've raised their children. Um, having been involved now for, for more than 10 years, I've seen uh, children go from, uh, from preschoolers to teenage, uh, to, to being teenagers, and I've learned an incredible amount from, from the FAP community. And, there are so many uh, important aspects to the self-esteem uh, of, of children that need to be taken into account. For instance, uh, it's important that they have friends and peers that value them and that they connect with uh, in, a, in the same as every other person on earth. And sometimes this, um, this might uh, require you to, uh, to educate people um, and to be a little bit more proactive in terms of making friends and good friends and, and, and peers um, and, and, and support your child in, in, in doing these things, uh, having sleepovers and going for visits and so on must be difficult, um, but it's important to try as far as possible uh, to develop those bonds um, early on. Um, support groups uh, just for yourselves as parents um, are, are, I think, invaluable because it can be a very lonely place having a, a child with so few, with, with, with such a rare disease, um, and that no one really understands uh, except other parents with the same uh, uh, in the same situation. It's important for our children uh, that they are grounded in in the culture and in the faith of their uh, of their parents, and that they receive the support and their um, acceptance of these communities. Um, it, it, it creates uh, a sense of belonging, and it's a very, very important to, to stimulate that and to, to safeguard it. So, lastly, uh, self-esteem. I mean, 
self-esteem is, is something that needs to be, to be developed in all children, um, and, um, uh, and it's very important to, to teach your children um, to, uh, to set challenges for them so that they can achieve challenges and they can um, uh, for, uh, reach the feeling of the sense of achieve, achievement that, uh, of accomplishment that one gets through uh, uh, encountering challenges and overcoming them. Um, we need to teach our children grit and determination and to focus on what children can do rather than focus on what they can't do. I just did a story about from one of our it's a, a South African FAP community family who felt very excluded because they weren't able to do sport and they were advised by another wise member of the team that they still managed to include uh, their own children in sport by, by um, making them part of the team in terms of um, being the scorer on the team or, or, uh, or being uh, uh, referees and so on. So there are, don't focus on what you can't do, but try and find a thing that your child can do well and then set them challenges in that direction so that they can get that sense of achievement and develop self-esteem and grit. <coughs> Um, I realize that many of my slides have, have, have not quite come through as I wanted to, um, but um, so, so I apologize about some of the images uh, not, not looking correct. Lastly, uh, it's important for children to play. Play is such a very important part of, of setting goals for yourself and being challenged, and it's very difficult for children, for parents, I think, with uh, children with FAP to watch them play because play can also be dangerous and children have an innate bravery that, that, that many of us uh, are very um, uh, intimidated by. Um, and so it's important to create the safe area to play but somehow we have to find a way for children to play and to express themselves fully in play. Um, it's the university of childhood. And lastly, we should, our children should be allowed to dream and should be, have goals. Um, and in as Maslow's hierarchy, uh, that self-actualization, uh, the person needs to become who they've always were meant to be. Um, so the painter must paint, the musician must make music. Um, and, uh, and, and it's important to find that thing so that, that motivates your child and to let them become that and to live that completely. Um, there's a wonderful um, book on the uh, IPOPA website uh, written by Sarah Steele and Marilyn Hare about uh, questions and answers for children. And they've listed there, you can see on the left, jobs that other people that they know with FOP have already achieved. And it's important to show your children this and to say, you can be anything you want to be. You might have to do it in a different way, but you do need to um, encourage your children and allow them to have goals and dreams and, 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 and support them in that. Um, so when I say that, I'm always uh, reminded uh, of the Tim Folgers movie where, where that, that's very evident to you in some of the wonderful uh, uh, people that you encounter there. Uh, so again, I, I mentioned this book by, the, by Sarah Steele and Marilyn Hare. Um, and, and I found a, a, a piece in there which I think is very important for children to remember and for parents to emphasize to their kids, and that is that you should try to remember that getting a flare-up is not your fault. You can't make FOP start or stop it. So if there's really nothing you can do to stop FOP but it's from growing. Try not to be so afraid of getting hurt that you don't try anything new or fun. FOP is, a, not the, is only one thing about you. You don't have to let it run your whole life. And I think that, that, that wisdom comes from from having experienced uh, uh, this with, with their own children. With that, I'd like to hand over to my good friend and colleague, uh, Patricia Belay, via Hope, uh, and it turns back to you. Hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Scott. It's wonderful to have a presentation focused on um, the children who are the future of the FOP community. Up next, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Patricia Delay. Dr. Delay is a dermatologist from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and she is the founder of the Brazilian FOP organization, which now has more than 100 Brazilian FOP families. Dr. Delay will be talking with us today about skin issues and dermatological care related to FOP. Over to you, Dr. Delay. 
Thank you, Hope. It's a great pleasure to be here today and to be able to to take to you a little bit of the dermatology world and FOP. For those that don't know me, I um, since the year to, it was in the year 2000 that I, I met my first FOP patient. And from that time on, I began a dermatologist and an FOP specialist. It sometimes sounds strange, but uh, you can be whatever you want to be, like Chris said. So I have chosen also to take care of FOP. Uh, just a little bit uh, for you, for those that don't remember what a dermatologist is, we take care of skin, nails, and hair. And a dermatologist is a medical doctor who specializes in conditions uh, involving those regions. We can identify and treat more than 3,000 conditions. And we treat from newborns to seniors. So you may all be wondering, wait, come on, I have FOP, such a complicated disease. Why should I care about dermatological problems? And I will tell you why. The skin is the biggest, uh, the largest organ in the human body. So please don't take it for granted. Just uh, two reasons are very important for you to pay attention to your skin. The skin is connected to all organs of your body and can give important clues for diagnosis, for diagnostic. And the skin is the first barrier of your body, not only against the environment, but against bacteria, fungus and virus. So you must take care of it. So let's take a look, a closer look about uh, at FOP and dermatology. To make it easier, uh, we have been uh, dividing dermatology problems in four main uh, kinds. We have skin problems that are possibly related to FOP itself, let's say linked to the genetic mutation. Of course, this needs to be confirmed by a study, uh, but it, there, these are things that we have seen in common in many patients. We have skin problems that are possibly related to a consequence of FOP, so high immobility, position of the body, poor blood circulation are all conditions that can change your skin. We have many skin problems that are possibly related to drugs, and it's important to remember or to remind you that uh, anti-inflammatories and uh, pain drugs are very much um, linked to dermatology problems. So we are going to talk about this uh, later. And there are, there are skin problems that are individual. It's always important, and I always talk about that, not everything is linked to FOP. So pay attention to everything that you have as any person. So here I start talking about skin problems that are possibly related to FOP. And you may have seen in your friends, seborrheic dermatitis, that is that greasy skin on the face and on the eyelids. You have also seborrheic dermatitis on the scalp, where you, you see uh, those white little scales falling and greasy hair. We have seen over the years strange, uh, irregular and intense pigmented moles. So it's important to pay attention. I remind you that none of this has any kind of confirmation. We still have to run an important study to know if this is linked to FOP or not. We have hypersensibility to insect bites. Some skin tumors, some rare skin tumors we have seen in patients with FOP, such as Merkel cell carcinoma. Then we go to something that I think is even more important, that are the skin problems that are possibly a consequence of FOP. 
So we all know that our bodies have folds and with FOP you are in positions that you may have a lot of folds that you cannot even reach. So intertrigo, intertrigo is an inflammatory condition of the skin folds induced or aggravated by heat, moisture, maceration, friction and lack of air circulation. So uh, it's important that you all look at your folds to avoid bacteria and fungus and viral infections on these folds. So intertrigus is something very, um, very common to see on people with FOP. Fungus on the nails. Uh, fungus on the folds, as we were talking before, here you see one on the legs. Between your toes. And the important, the very important pressure source. So it's very, very uh, frequent to see people that uh, put a lot of pressure in one, one portion of the skin, and then you have the pressure source. And this you all must be aware of and must be treated as soon as you identify a little sore, you must look for your dermatologist or for your clinician. To, to treat it as soon as possible. You also have, because of the, of the bad circulation, you have the purple spots that you can see on your legs that in fact are uh, circulatory problems. And you may have blisters because of the same circulatory problems because of lymphedema. Remember that you have a lot of vessels on your limbs and these vessels can get stretched and they go the skin stretches too and it opens so you have the blisters this happens when uh, the lymphatic circulation is not good enough so when you see those blisters also please look for a dermatologist because it's very important to avoid skin infections. So I think here is something that I need to warn you all because infection is something that we don't want to see in people with FOP and once you realize that you have something infected on your, on your skin, don't just go over it. It must be treated. Then we have skin problems that are possibly related to drugs. You have seen uh, people taking uh, drugs on clinical trials that have the dry lips. You can have dry skin, you can have eczema and itching. So it's always important to moisturize your skin. You can have acne as a result of some drugs too. We call monomorphic acne because you, won't, you don't have uh, little brown spots, you only have pustulas. And you can also have the loss of eyebrows. Then the skin problems possibly related to the use of drugs. You can have hives rashes and many other um, conditions that are related to drugs and as I told you mainly anti-inflammatory and uh, drug, pain, drug pains, uh, pain drugs, sorry. And finally you have skin problems that are individual. Maybe I have psoriasis and it has nothing to do with FOP. So it's always important to remember that not everything is FOP. So it's very common to see someone coming and saying, hey doctor, I never uh, cared much about this because I thought it was from FOP and in reality it was not. It's a, a, a skin tumor or something like this. So remember, you are all individuals and you must be treated as a, an individual, as anyone, you are not FOP. And then I would like to give you some advice for people for, for to treat about to treat of your skin. Here is the first one, and I love those those dogs and cats. You have to check your skin at least once per week. 
ask someone to help you. I know you can, sometimes you cannot see your back, you cannot fold your body, but you have to check your body folds, your back in between fingers, nails, scalp, covered areas of the body. This is very important and behind the ears. Everything is important. So if you see a, a wound that is not healing, if you see a spot that looks strange, too dark or irregular or too much intense, if you see anything that is catching your attention, please call your doctor. I am a, I, as a dermatologist and part of the ICC and uh, I know FOP, I am here to help anyone that needs, but at the end, you need to have your, your local dermatologist. The other thing you cannot forget, please protect yourself from the sun. Sunscreen is something that must be used every day. And you may say, I don't go out. I, why do I have to use that? You have to use that because you are exposed to light. So use it. Everything that is out of your clothes must be protected. And don't forget, you can use hats, you can use sunglasses for your eyes, you can use an umbrella, but protect yourself. I have seen a lot of FOP patients with skin uh, tumors that were caused by the sun. Here is something that I would like you to be um, careful with. Your showers, your baths. A bath must be, must be really fast, less than five minutes. Not too much soap, warm to cold water, only one per day, and never ever use abrasive uh, bath sponges. This is important to keep your skin uh, without any kind of break because remember it's your barrier. Avoid the pressure on your body. Use moisturizers. Make your skin stronger. Drink a lot of water and like Mona said yesterday, a very good diet. It's important not to get too thin because your skin is going to break on pressure places. So be aware, you need to take care of your, your skin. And finally, as I said, consult a dermatologist. At least once per year, let him have a look at your skin. Uh, again, I will be here, but you must have your own. So thank you very much, obrigada, for this wonderful time and opportunity to help. I will leave you with Hope again, so she will introduce the next panelist. Thank you so much, Dr. Delay. I um, can see in the comments that this was a really important topic for so many of our community members. This was the first time that they were hearing about this. So thank you so much for bringing this to the forefront um, and also for your adorable animal pictures. Those were also a big hit. So <laughs> thank you for bringing the, cute, the cuteness as well. Up next, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Genevieve Bujat. Dr. Bujat is a pediatrician by training, a clinical genesis and consultant in the Center of Reference for Skeletal Dysplasia in the Imagine Institute of Necker Infants Maladies Hospital in Paris, France. Dr. Bujat today will be sharing some information about physiotherapy and FOP. Over to you, Dr. Bujat. Thank you. Thank you, Hope. And, uh... Hello everybody, it's a great pleasure also to be here and to share with you some uh, elements, some consideration on uh, 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 physiotherapy, uh, which is uh, Alors, just to go in the next. Uh, thank you. Uh, to to it, it's a, a part of uh, care in FOP that uh, we are uh, convinced about the importance, especially uh, uh, it is a long term uh, type of care. It will vary uh, depending uh, the age, the stage. Uh, and uh, the uh, incidental events, uh, including uh, flare-up, and uh, all uh, these elements were prepared by uh, our team uh, uh, with uh, the, uh, our uh, um, physical therapist and physician Michel Lemoine, uh, 
but also for the adult part, Thomas van Bretano and uh, several physiotherapists in our center. So we will just give some general considerations and uh, I think that you all are aware of uh, uh, these uh, different elements uh, on the physiotherapy. First, for us in our country, uh, this is something that has to be detailed by a medical prescription uh, with some uh, guidelines to precise what is uh, uh, aimed uh, for this patient uh, and of course, it is uh, always an active uh, physiotherapy uh, with a smooth guided and induced movements in short sessions in a, a nice place. Often uh, it is in young people uh, in a, a medical place or in a special uh, physical therapy uh, place. place. But it also be uh, uh, able to do it uh, at home by somebody uh, 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 re uh, doing it uh, remotely, and uh, the use of uh, we call warm water therapy or balneotherapy is often useful uh, in some cases. Usually, we uh, start uh, having this physiotherapy uh, depending. Uh, of course, the stage and the course of the disease after four or six years uh, before first uh, there is no need and uh, it needs also a participation of the, the child. Uh, then the frequency will depend of the stage and occurrence of flares and also uh, because it is something that will be uh, uh, as a long term uh, activity uh, as an extracurricular activity it uh, will uh, be important sometimes to do stock and so depending uh, the child depending the uh, stage depending the events uh, or it is only a series of sessions or it will be regularly organized uh, for, uh, for for some um, uh, in some uh, um, uh, deterioration uh, of the patient, it will be uh, important to have more sessions, uh, uh, maybe three, four sessions a, a week, but sometimes it is just a regular uh, interment uh, with two or three sessions per month. Uh, it will be in a comfortable room, of course, in a non-sleep floor, and it will be an individual tailored uh, uh, prescription and not stereotyped uh, with uh, several uh, uh, patients working uh, in parallel. So before to start, uh, at the beginning, the physical therapist and the uh, FOP people will uh, have to know each other and uh, to uh, uh, discover, to uh, appreciate them, uh, to uh, identify affected segments, deformities, but also capabilities, chronology of ectopic calcification appearance, which one are the oldest, which one are the less, uh, the, the, the more recent one, what, uh, what about pain, sore, discomfort, which deformations require compensatory measures and uh, walking and equilibrium assessment, of course, uh, uh, file history and something else which is a part of the physiotherapy, uh, which is the uh, pulmonary uh, assessment with respiratory volumes and the fact to use non-invasive ventilation uh, or not. So sessions are once again in a friendly atmosphere, especially in children, with a session of short duration, never to get tired, never ever forcing, don't cause any pain, no, no passive mobilization, and of course, always to work with a positive accent. And 
In case of inflammatory time, especially in flare-up, uh, these sessions will move to other type of with reinsurance, relaxation, preservation of mobility uh, below the affected region, uh, and with the use of painkillers before uh, the session. Of course, self-education, uh, parents association, enfin, inclusion of parents and caregiver to uh, sensibilize them, uh, it's all also, uh, are also keywords important in uh, this uh, uh, type of care. So the various uh, work steps are quite um, stereotyped. Uh, first, exercise on joints to maintain, to maintain the mobility of these joints and the available amplitudes. It is no, there is no need to try to uh, um, uh, go to uh, have a, a better amplitude, but uh, to uh, keep them and after flare, it is also very important to work on, uh, to, to try to uh, have better amplitude. Uh, joints after joints with uh, the uh, knowledge on compensatory movements, bodily awareness, work on proprioception and equilibrium to fight against deformations, uh, the posturation and uh, Uh, also, uh, uh, pulmonary volumes, as we said, to work on diaphragm. In adult, when uh, the movements are uh, diminished, it will be slow and gentle mobilization of muscle masses in lower limbs, muscular and uh, in uh, uh, muscular region under the blockage. Uh, sole uh, of the foot may help for the blood circulation and venous relaxation. So these are only uh, some keywords, but we uh, performed uh, last year a tuto, video tuto that uh, you will be able to uh, see uh, today, I think, and uh, with uh, some uh, other consideration for this uh, type of uh, uh, work. And uh, this is uh, just uh, a, a picture of uh, to, to once again to give a positive uh, connotation on this uh, type of uh, care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brujat. Um, as Genevieve mentioned, Later today, there will be a session called Complementary Therapies, which will feature a presentation, a pre-recorded presentation by Dr. Michelle Lamon. And also we will be showing the Tute Kim video that Genevieve mentioned as well. So if you are interested in this topic, this was meant to be um, a little bit of a teaser to hopefully encourage you to join us in that next, next session taking place later today. Um, so I'll be joined now by all of our panelists, and we are going to move to the Q&A portion of today's panels. So I'd like to start, um, Dr. Keene, with some questions that came in related to COVID. Uh, the first question for you is that if someone learns they have been exposed um, or have been exposed to someone who has been exposed, like a caregiver or family member, um, is there a specific context um, for that individual with FOP that they should follow to um, you know, look out for symptoms or to um, make sure that when they are reintroduced to that person who's been exposed, that it's in a safe way? So the, again, I, oops, sorry. So the, um, again, I think that there will be sort of slightly country specific advice, but I suppose the first thing would be obviously, you know, if if the person that they've been exposed with is in their close environment, ideally that person has to isolate as best they can to keep them away from the person with FOP. I think as we don't have any sort of preventative treatments, I think that the, 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 the thought process would be that the person with FOP just needs to be very aware of any of those symptoms that I talked about that, that could be suggestive of, you know, sort of, potentially catching the, the condition and obviously then seeking 
uh, uh, you know, maybe to, if they can, can get access to a test at that point. So I think it would be incredibly watch, watching for any sort of symptoms that might suggest the start of viral infection. Great, thank you, Dr. King. Um, there is another question related to the safety of um, the vaccines that are being developed. So does anyone have any inclination of um, if any of the companies developing a vaccine, if those will be able to be safely administered to people with FOP um, subcutaneously? I mean, I mean, I think at the moment the, the, these vaccines are in such early stage development. Um, I mean, I think my understanding is, is that, you know, um, some of the new, well, at least the Pfizer vaccines, these sort of these new RNA vaccines, where they're injecting some of the genetic material, they can be given subcutaneously, but I don't suppose they will have been given to anyone with FOP. So I think we just need to probably wait, you know, see what the sort of types of reactions people might get as they start to go through. But they, again, none of the data has been published um, for us to look at. But I think. You know, I think we're, we're just going to have to see what the what the side effect profile is in people without FOP, how well it's tolerated, and then, you know, I, I think as long as biologically it can work subcutaneously, one would hope that given that other vaccines can be given subcutaneously um, and are tolerated and don't seem to give flare-ups, that one would hope we could do that. I think the biggest thing is, as Chris pointed out, is you know, we want to make sure that the vaccines we, we obviously cannot be given our intramuscular injection i think perhaps the if we if you have policies and healthcare systems trying to mass make huge populations it's just important that people with fop can take a step back and say hang on i need to have this given in a different way that you're not sort of just pushed into a system that doesn't allow the differences to, to you know, for you not to have it subcutaneously i don't know if anyone else has got any thoughts um, from a other international perspective Thank you, Dr. Keane, for shedding some light on that topic. I know it's a hard question to answer. Um, Dr. Scott, this one is for you. So the question has come up that um, a child is waking up multiple times in the night to empty their bladder um, and also seems to not be able to hold it for long. So if a urine infection has been ruled out, could this be due to FOP or to the resulting scoliosis? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, there are a number of things that uh, may cause this in, in children without FOP, um, such as uh, too much fluid intake at night or a condition such as diabetes or diabetes insipidus that makes uh, a child make too much urine and, and therefore the bladder can't cope with, uh, with the urine volume. Um, there is also the situation where certain bladders are just more irritable than others and have a smaller volume than others. But certainly, if in the case of FOP, one the only one of those that oh, none of those really, uh, as far as I know, are frequently implied in, in, in FOP. So one thing that can happen is that deformities of the spine can have uh, pressure effects on the roots of nerves, and the nerves can uh, the nerves are responsible for controlling the volume of the bladder and also when when it empties or not. So I, I do think it's worth having a closer look at, 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 at what's happening by checking the urine, not just for infection, but to check it. Um, uh, it's important to check the um, concentration of the urine as well as the amount of sugar in the urine, and then uh, uh, to, to, to have a, a look at the bladder and see uh, whether the bladder is large volume or small volume, probably by doing a, an ultrasound. So I think it's, it's worth getting back to the to the local doctors um, and, and to have, have that checked out. With. But um, bladder issues other than through kidney stones and so on are not, are not, as far as I know, a common problem in children with FOP unless they have um, severe spinal involvement. Thank you, Dr. Scott, uh, and for sharing. I welcome anyone to comment on that. Yeah. Um, if no one else has a comment on that, I'll move on to a question for Dr. Delay. So Dr. Delay, can you discuss the safety and our precautions of using compression garments to help with lymphedema? 
Well, I think this is a question uh, for your uh, vascular doctor, if you must use it or not. But you must be aware that if you have some kind of break on your leg skin, it can hurt it more. So the best thing would be to put your, your bed a little bit up at the end. Let's say uh, you, you can uh, help the blood and the lungs to go down back to the heart and uh, use the compression uh, stocks when your vascular uh, doctor advise you to. And any idea why specifically the eyebrows fall off or out? Well, this is uh, something that maybe um, a Regeneron can help us with because it's uh, from uh, the drug that's being studied. And we also see it as part of FOP. We didn't study it, it, it studied yet. So we still have all those questions to answer. And, and then one more for you, Dr. Delay. So um, do you recommend to not use any body or face scrub? You talked about um, not using a sponge or a harsh a harsh um, sponge to wash. Do you also recommend avoiding body or face scrubs? Well, for the face, I think it's safe to be used, but never too strong. And definitely for the body, never, because you if you break your skin, you are opening a door for bacteria. So the best thing is not doing it. For the face, it's okay if your dermatology advise you to. Um, and one more question for you, Dr. Delay. Um, so if someone says that they have problems with their hair and skin, they're oily and full of dandruff. So is this something you would recommend reaching out to a dermatologist in their um, local area to consult with? Yes, I think so, because uh, you can use shampoos and special uh, products that can help you not to have the, the oil uh, scalp. So I think the dermatologist, the lo local dermatologist can help. And it's also important not only by, for aesthetic reasons, let's say just to be beautiful. Uh, it's important because remember, always remember that if you have a break on your, on your skin, you're opening a door for bacteria and other other my, micro, um, other virus and fungus and so on. So also on your scalp, it's not just a question of beauty. Thank you. And then um, Dr. Bujat, I know you touched on this um, at one point in your presentation, but can you expand a little bit on some of the differences that you see in the physical or the physiotherapy um, practices that you use with the children with FOP and how those vary from the practices used with adults with FOP? Dr. Bujat might be muted. Okay, let's try again. Oh, no, I'm still not hearing her. Okay, we can um, go to another question. So this one is um, kind of open to anyone, but the question is, is it okay for an individual with FOP to get their ears pierced? Yes, I think it's okay. Uh, you're not uh, hurting any muscle, it's just uh, the skin and subcutaneous uh, part of your ear. So it's okay, as long as it's clean enough. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, um, some, we've had patients with, with, with pierced ears and yeah, they, they, they all seem to have had no, that hasn't seemed to have caused any problems. But I agree, you need to make sure it's, it's a clean and a reputable person doing it. But yeah, I, I think it would be okay. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so maybe this one is geared towards Dr. Scott. Um, the question is, what care should be taken to prevent new swellings? Um, I don't know if this is directly related to a child, um, 
But if you wanted to start, Dr. Scott, we could um, ping pong or go on to the next panelist from there. Uh, to avoid new swellings. Um, well, I mean, it's important to avoid uh, trauma. And so the, the main things that one can do to avoid that is, of course, avoid activities that cause trauma. Um, but in some cases, uh, some extra care needs to be taken. For instance, children whose arms uh, are limited and can't reach uh, up should uh, to protect themselves when they fall should uh, uh, probably be issued with a helmet. Uh, it becomes, uh, or, or some protective headgear, which obviously becomes an issue for, for teenagers. But, um, but, uh, I, I think I showed a slide of a, of a, of a, of a child in our clinic who was, was quite happily wearing, wearing a helmet. And that can prevent, uh, 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 uh other injuries, uh, not just, uh, lumps. Unfortunately, we're all, um, uh, looking for ways to, be able to switch this whole thing off, as you know, and um, and and in the future when we've got therapy that will be able to control the underlying disease process, we, we may be able uh, to, to prevent them from coming. But some lumps come up spontaneously and, 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 and at this time there's no real uh, way to, to, to avoid the, the swelling. Um, have I answered the right question uh, that, that, that was about swellings? Yes, I think you've covered it. Does anyone else want to add anything to what Dr. Scott has shared? Okay, I don't know. Did we get you back, Dr. Bujat? Can you um, try to speak and see if we can hear you? Yes, I can hear you. I, I don't know why it was so quiet. So uh, about the question, uh, yes, it is a really a different type of work between uh, children and between uh, adults, uh, especially for uh, older uh, people. Uh, um, in children, we will uh, uh, have uh, also short sessions, but with uh, always this uh, uh, to fight against uh, deformities to uh, help them to keep their uh, um, uh, joint. Uh, 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 um, 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 uh, and uh, to uh, work on the proprioception to uh, to try to uh, learn how to avoid if possible the uh, falls. Uh, then, uh, 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 in older people, it will be more uh, uh, to uh, do some slight message, muscle message. Uh, to help uh, blood circulation, to also uh, uh, ask people to uh, do uh, muscle contraction, to also uh, help uh, blood circulation, to work on respiratory volumes because diaphragm won't never be affected. Uh, and uh, also, even if there is uh, ankylosis, to try to keep uh, the mobility even if it is a very uh, uh, slight one, uh, the mobility of joints. Uh, uh, actually, uh, actually, uh, uh, the physiotherapy, the, 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 the type of physiotherapy will be uh, uh, adapted to each uh, uh, people. And uh, uh, it is always different from one to another, but always considering uh, joint, joint ankylosis, posturing, uh, uh, deformities, muscle uh, mobilization, uh, volumes, proprioceptory uh, volumes, and proprioception. So then, with this uh, declination, declination of uh, elements, we uh, will adapt uh, from one to another people. Thank you, Dr. Bichat. Um, so I have one more question. If anyone wants to take a minute to submit any last questions during the in the Q and A box um, or the chat, please go ahead and send those in now. Um, this is the last question that I see. So um, this one is for you, Dr. Delai. What is the best way to treat broken skin in restricted areas? So um, in this situation, if it was under the arm. Um, and it's been ongoing for you know a year. What is the best way to address that type of issue? Well, uh, of course, this is not something that we can say uh, that there is a best way for all. 
everyone is a different uh, has a different situation but okay let's say that i have my underarm that is i have a broken skin it's macerated and maybe infected the first thing is to keep it dry so remember you have the hair dryer that you can use to dry and it's such a powerful tool that many people don't don't even try then uh, you have to wash it so use the devices that the ifopa has that are so um that are, are for cleaning the underarm uh and check if it's infected or not maybe you need oral antibiotics or maybe just topic and there is something that um I use a lot here in Brazil, and you also have it in, in the United States and over the, the world, that is the boric water. Uh, I have a friend that uses it a lot, and uh, she found in the United States as for use for the, for the eyes. And you can make compresses of boric water to keep, keep the place clean and dry. So, of course, each one is different. So if, if you have, if it's uh, infected, the boric water may clean. But I can help you individually if you need help. Um, oh, there is one more question that is coming through the chat. Um, and I believe this one is directed towards you, Dr. Scott. Um, and it is a question that I recognize you may not be able to answer. But the question is, That's is good. there any clear, the case? Can you hear me? Is there any clarification on when um, patients in Africa may be able to be involved in clinical trials? Uh, thanks. That, that is a great question. We've, we've tried very hard uh, to become part of the clinical trials, but these clinical trials are not straightforward. Um, they are extremely complex, and, uh, and while we do many clinical trials here in South Africa, um, it 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 uh, the uh, it hasn't been uh, uh, possible to to attract one of the companies to be able to um, take part in clinical trials here. We were very close on the first trial, um, but unfortunately, not fortunately, unfortunately for us, the, that trial enrolled uh, to to completion very quickly before we could get approval. And unfortunately, our approval system is a little slower than than many other parts of the world. Uh, it's not through lack of interest or trying, but uh, there's really only uh, one or two places in South Africa where you can do these kinds of trials, and unfortunately, very few patients are in each of those areas, so it, so it makes it very difficult, and I'm sure that's the situation in many, uh, most of, of, of the developing or less resourced countries, um, uh, with the exception of uh, um, uh, Brazil and Argentina have been very successful in enrolling kids in trials and congratulations to them uh, for doing so. But the last thing I want to say on that hope is that um, the best thing for us uh, to the questioner is w that the trials go ahead wherever they go ahead and that we get access to the final uh, product once they're approved and safe. Uh, we should really stop thinking about clinical trials as therapy. Um, because there are still clinical trials and there are risks and there are um, uh, they're a great avenue to therapy uh, early on, but, but it's not the same as having a, a medicine that's already been approved and been checked and been safe and to, known to be efficacious. So while we're all very, very keen to get everyone on some kind of therapy as soon as possible, um, I think at this stage our safest route uh, would be to wait for approval of drugs um, and, and to go to go that way. Having said that, we're always still open to to enrolling patients in clinical trials uh, in Africa. Should 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 the companies hope to uh, come here and invest? Uh, it's a it's a huge undertaking to start in a different country. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for answering that question. Um, so we have a bit of a break in our presentation schedule now from. Um, 9.30 Eastern time to 11. Um, there will be some time for um, community social events. So if you'd like to play virtual bingo or participate in our caregiver journaling workshop, you can find the links to those in the agenda in the theater. And we will be starting sessions back up at 11 a.m. Eastern time, 1600 GMT, with um, three concurrent sessions, which you can choose to attend one 
um, that is a pain management panel, a dental care and anesthesia experts panel, and a IFOP research update from Adam Sherman with the International FOP Association. So if um, you all want to take a chance to kind of look at those and see which one you are leaning towards, they will all be recorded and available to watch on demand afterwards. Um, so there is that. But I hope everyone enjoyed this session, and I look forward to seeing you all later today. Thank you.